Good morning, everyone, and welcome to week three of our sermon series through 2 Corinthians. I am interim pastor Angie Mabry. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church Plano, Texas, online worship. Once again, it is a pleasure to see you. And starting with our morning announcements, first, I'd like to remind you that we are doing a virtual vacation Bible school, VVBS, and that starts on Monday, July 27th. And if you are a local person, there is still time for you to register, and we will let you know when you can drive by the church and pick up your special VVBS box. Second announcement is what you are probably expecting is make sure that you have your lighter and your candle ready for when we light our Christ candle together. It is a pleasure, as I say every Sunday, to be in the presence of the Lord. We are grateful for our music. So as you settle in and prepare your hearts and your minds for worship, listen for and sense God's presence with you. In the name of Jesus Christ, welcome to worship. In our 2 Corinthians reading today, Paul reminds us of the God who created light out of darkness. We are reminded of God's power. We are reminded of the light of Christ that is with us always by the power of the Holy Spirit. So friends, once again, we are reminded that we are gathered together by the power of the Holy Spirit, and Christ is with us. So we light our candle together to be reminded of just that. And we give glory to God as we worship. Amen. God pours out God's mercy upon us. And we do not lose heart. Oh, oh give, give thanks, thanks to the Lord. Lord. Call, Call on God's name. Make known God's deeds among the peoples. God's light shines out of darkness. And into our hearts. From, From generation, generation to generation, generation God, God is mindful of, of the covenant that, that God made with God's, God's people. Even though we are frail. Enduring suffering causing and reconciling strife, fighting oppression and judgment from without and within. God's, God's Spirit, Spirit is, is at, at work. work. God's Spirit works within us. God's Spirit works amongst us. 
God's Spirit works all around us. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Indeed, Holy One, your spirit works within, amongst, and all around us. It is your Holy Spirit that has called us to worship today. It is your Holy Spirit that binds us together, whether we are physically together or not. Holy One, we come today to give you thanks and praise, to honor you, to adore you, to bow down before you as you are the only one who is worthy. Lord, help us to enjoy you as we worship. It is in your name that we pray. Amen. Executed, not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. I am blessed beyond the curse, for his promise will endure. That his joy is going to be my strength. And though the sorrow may last for the night, his joy comes with the morning. I'm training my sorrows. I'm training my Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. I am pressed but not crushed, persecuted, not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. I am blessed beyond the curse, for his promise will endure. That his joy is going to be my strength. Though the sorrow may last for the night, his joy comes with the morning. I'm training my sorrows. I'm training my shame. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. I'm training my Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. And we say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. Amen. Yes, Lord, indeed. Friends, we can trade our sorrows and we can lay everything down. All of the stuff that stresses us out, all of our sins, all of our failings, all of our character defects, all of our shortcomings, we can lay it down for the joy of the Lord. And we do this by confessing our sins. 
So let's not hesitate. Let's come together as a body of believers through this technology and pray together our prayer of confession. The words will be on your screen. Let us pray. Holy God, we open our hearts to you this day and offer the truth of our lives, the fear that stifles us, the prejudice that blinds us, the ignorance that hobbles us, and the doubt that plagues us. Help us, we pray, that we will find courage in you. See the world as you do, with gracious eyes. Place ourselves where love is needed, and have faith that you strengthened and are with us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take some time for contemplative confession. Friends, in baptism, we receive a big yes from God. And as we come to the fount, we are reminded of that big yes. That God claimed us as God's own, sends the Holy Spirit to renew us daily, and adopted us into God's family as God's own. And we are being made more and more Christ-like by the power of the Holy Spirit. And of course, when we come and we lay down our sins, God is sure to forgive. Beloved of the Lord, you have confessed your sins. Your loving God has forgiven you. Thanks be to God. Amen? Amen. first scripture reading is Psalm 105, verses 1 through 11 and 45b. Listen with all of your capacity as the Holy Spirit breathes alive scripture again. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles, and the judgments he has uttered. O offspring of his servant Abraham, children of Jacob, his chosen ones, 
He is the Lord our God. His judgment are in all the earth. He is mindful of his covenant forever, of the word that he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant that he made with Abraham, his sworn promise to Isaac, which he confirmed to Jacob as a statute, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying to you, I will give the land of Canaan as your portion for an inheritance. Praise the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture reading today is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 18. Listen for the word of the Lord. Therefore, since it is by God's mercy that we are engaged in this ministry, we do not lose heart. We have renounced the shameful things that one hides. We refuse to practice cunning or to falsify God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to the conscience of everyone in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness. Who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ? But we have this treasure in clay jars, so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake so that the work in us, but live in you. But just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with Scripture, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe and so we speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake, so that grace, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God, so that we do, so we do not lose heart, even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an internal weight of glory beyond all measure, because we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love. Holy One, may the thoughts and meditations of our hearts and minds be acceptable in your sight as we receive this word from you. May we leave everything that is not of you behind. Focus us with your breath of fire and creativity. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Fragile. According to the definition, it means easily broken or damaged, flimsy or insubstantial, easily destroyed. Contrary to popular belief in lore, It is not an Italian word pronounced fragile. It's a word that means easily broken. As we talked about last week, there are plenty of things in this world of ours that are either broken or are easily broken. Plenty of things in this world of ours that are fragile. Last week, we talked about relationships relationships within communities. 
almost everything that is created is fragile to a certain extent. One might wonder why God created in the first place. Let's get back to that. I remember as a mother when my girls were young, when they were toddlers, and we would go to somebody's house, and they would have fragile stuff out in their house, unlike ours, which was totally childproofed. And I remember going and visiting and having to be just vigilant, like, don't touch that. Oh, let me move that. Honey, get away from there. I was exhausted by the time that we left the people's house. As fun as the, as the visit was, why would anybody create anything that is fragile in a world where things so easily are destroyed? Pastor Leon Bird knows a lot about fragility He had a lot of experiences of fragility and brokenness in his own life well before he became the pastor of Soul Church. Soul Church, in case you've never heard of it, is a ministry, or at least it was, of downtown Dallas. It's a ministry for the folks who aren't having a place to be, whether it's because they're homeless or it's because they are in transition or maybe they didn't have a church home, anyone and everyone was welcome at Soul Church. By the way, that's an acronym. It stands for Servants of Our Lord Church. And it began in downtown Dallas, and it was in an open-air lot at the corner of St. Paul and Corsicana, right across from the Bridge Homeless Recovery Center. Actually, Soul Church started before the bridge was even built. This was something that started way after Pastor Leon was passionate about all folks, particularly folks who didn't have a home and were hungry for a long time. Before that, he had been just driving down to downtown Dallas with, with truckloads of either donuts or different types of food and just going and trying to find people who gathered to give them something to eat because he understood the fragility of life when other someone is living on the streets. If anybody understands fragility and human brokenness, it's somebody who doesn't have a home. If somebody understands fragility and brokenness, It's somebody who has had a life and and had these change and, and things have just dropped out. The bottom has dropped out and systems have failed them and maybe families have broken apart and now they have no place to call home. Yeah, there's a lot of familiarity of fragility with the homeless community. And yet Pastor Leon knew of the power of community of the power of hearing the word of God, of the power of the people who became his church, knowing that at least for one day a week, for several hours, these folks would have a place to call home. It started out with a passion. It started out as a dream. It started out with a hunger, Soul Church did. And it ended The dream ended, or did it? Lord, thank you for a broken people, Pastor Leon prayed on their very last day together of worshiping in December of 2019. He says, broken people are real people. Lord, they ain't got nothing to hide behind, and that's okay. See, what started out as a man with a passion driving around in just his truck trying to find people eventually turned into this same man with a passion buying a school bus and painting it red. And then he later married, or excuse me, after the church had already been, nope, can't remember when they got married. He and his wife, Jennifer, doesn't matter when they got married, had this church together where they served And the lot 
was on the side of a building that was owned by Daniel Millett. He was a man who had complained to the city of Dallas whenever news came out that the homeless shelter was going to be built across the street from his building. The people of what is now Seoul Church didn't have anywhere to be. And at that time, the city of Dallas, in 2006, I should say, a national advocacy group ranked Dallas as among the meanest cities, quote unquote, towards the homeless, measured by its punitive practices. The city had a history of enforcing ordinances and increasing waves, banning panhandling, prohibiting shopping carts on the streets, criminalizing sleeping in public, bulldozing tent encampments, and throwing away people's personal property, identification, and medicine. Yeah, the people who are homeless know a lot about fragility because what little that you have might easily get taken away. What place that you think that you found that you can hang out will all of a sudden be told, hey, you can't hang out there anymore. The city passed a new ordinance in 2006 that prohibited feeding hungry people on the streets, something that Pastor Leon and his wife Jennifer have been doing for years. And in order to follow the law, they could only serve food in city-approved locations after volunteers received food safety training. They did not want for their ministry to the people who were homeless and hungry and needing love and community and support. The most broken of folks within our community, the least protected of folks within society. They did not want that ministry to end, and they started praying. And the very last person that they expected to open the doors of what became Soul Church at its location at the corner of St. Paul and Corsicana in downtown Dallas, Dallas was Daniel Millett himself. This man said to Leon and Jennifer with this offer, keep the place clean and mind your people, and I will yet let you use this lot as long as he lived. That was in 2008. Mr. Millett passed away in June of 2019. The birds understand fragility. They understand it from their own lives. They understand it from the people who were their parishioners. They understand it just from the nature of having an outdoor ministry. And yet, they were faithful. And they continued because they knew that there was something stronger than the very fragility of this of this ministry, of the folks that they are ministering to. Slowly but surely, over time, more and more people started coming on. There were some people who came and starting, starting to prepare food for the visitors, for the members themselves. Members who you might want to keep in mind were not able to tithe. Where was the money coming from? From donations, from grants from other people who started hearing about this ministry and wanting to be a part of it. At five o'clock in the morning, people would show up and start setting out and preparing food and having a take-along sack lunch so that people could go on and have more food. Over time, some other people came in and started preparing and started providing clothes for the folks. Over time, there was even a chiropractor who came so that they could provide different types of adjustments for the people as needed. Over time, there was someone who was a nail technician that started coming that would help give manicures and pedicures and clean all the dirt and everything underneath people's nails. Over time, eventually, there came someone who donated a couple of porta-potties so that these people who had no choice but to relieve themselves in public could have some dignity at least for a couple of hours on Sunday morning. 
And during the worship services, oh, during the worship services, you might not even know that there was a concern about the fragility of life being on the streets, not knowing where your next meal is going to come from, if a meal is going to come, not knowing if you're going to be dead or alive one day or the next, not knowing, not knowing the fragility of it all. But the worship services, there was this, this strength, this there's something that was beyond it all when the worship started happening. The word got preached. There was a band that would play. And it ended up that some people ended up coming from the church, from the homeless shelter across the way because the music started blaring at the corner of St. Paul and Corsicana. It early in the morning on Sunday morning. So they thought, well, I might as well just go out and find out what's going on over there. And they found love. They found joy. They found the gospel of Jesus Christ. They found commitment. They found family. They found salvation. They found resurrection. They found strength amid the fragility. Why would anyone create something that is fragile, that's going to break anyway, because that God knew that although the vessels and even the creation, even the systems that that creation created, even though they might break, there was something bigger going on, something that was present at the exact same time. This is something that Paul calls in our scripture for today, treasure in clay jars. You see, Paul himself knew a lot about fragility, knew a lot about brokenness. In our text for today, Paul is kind of coming to this point, at least within the early part of our text of, of 2 Corinthians, where he is making a defense for his ministry. We noted in our text from chapter 2 that it was already, he was responding to things that were going on. People have been coming and bringing in a different or a new gospel of Jesus Christ Scholars think that maybe even these folks had been saying maybe they didn't have to uh, do things that Paul said that people were saying, that Paul said that people would have to do. And they were calling his authority into question, and Paul is defending himself. He knows that this little church that he planted just three years ago is so fragile that you might not want to speak beyond a whisper. Because otherwise, it might break apart. Paul understands the fragility of his own ministry. See, whenever he talks about, in our chapter today, when he talks about commending themselves to the Corinthians, this refers to a practice that was common in the time with itinerant missionaries. They would come with letters of commendation or letters of recommendation, and they would give it to the community. And it would say something to the effect of, of, hi, I am big time theological teacher and preacher, and my name is blank. And I am commending Paul. He is a teacher. He is a student of mine. He's a disciple of mine. He's someone that I have come to know and understand as somebody who understands, somebody who is knowledgeable, somebody who is preaching what is coming from God. Yeah, Paul didn't have any of these letters. He didn't come with any of these, and that was seen to be a deficiency. And so when he would come and when he would preach, he would say, I come with no letters of commendation, and really I don't need them because what I preach and what I say comes from God. I do not come commending myself as I am. Yes, I commend myself, but I do not proclaim myself, he says. I proclaim Jesus Christ. He understands that maybe people might doubt who he is because it wasn't that long ago in his memory or in the people's memory that he was Saul, the persecutors, 
the persecutor of Christians, people would remember that. Now, wait a minute, wasn't it just a year or two ago that you were killing all of us? And now, not only are you saying that you're a preacher of this gospel, but you're apostle of the one that you were persecuting. And now you're saying that we need to listen to you as you plant this church. Yeah, Paul understood a lot about fragility. He understood it when he was experiencing suffering from the Roman Empire for preaching this new religion and saying someone else other than Caesar is Lord. That was a offense of huge, huge circumstances, huge consequences. And yet he kept going no matter what, no matter what suffering he knew that might happen because he knew that he was called to preach the gospel of the Lord. And he knew that preaching this would bring suffering. And yet he was strengthened by the word of the Lord that he was preaching and the works of Jesus that were happening amongst the communities. Yes, Paul understood fragility within his own body within his own commendation, within his own reputation of what had happened. He understood it within the fragility of this little church that he had planted that is already starting to fall apart. And this little church that was, that was brought, made up of people who were fragile, people who were slaves, people who were poor and day workers, those who were uneducated, those who were by far the marginalized of society. Paul understood fragility on many levels very, very well. And yet, he preaches and he writes with such compassion and such strength you know that he is not asking why would anybody create something that is easily broken for he says we have this treasure in clay jars so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. People would have understood the metaphor treasure in clay jars Clay jars were quite common during this time. They were made from the soil of the ground. And they were dried in the sun. And the thing about these clay jars, the way that they were made, some were small, some were larger, they were great places to keep things that mattered the most to people. And as a matter of fact, people who would keep their money and store it away would keep it in these clay jars. Archaeologists have found clay jars that were filled with coins. And these are in museums in different places throughout the world. So it was not uncommon for people to keep treasure in clay jars. Now the thing about clay jars they're extremely fragile, easily broken. So does it make sense that people would keep something that is valuable, something that is precious, something that is a treasure in something that is easily broken or easily damaged, in something that is flimsy or insubstantial, in something that is easily destroyed. While we might think that it makes no sense for people to do this, it was a practice, and it was understood. And it was something Paul is saying that God, God self has done. We have this treasure in clay jars, Paul says, so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power comes, belongs to God, and does not come 
from us. We need to make it clear, says Ernest Best, who is the author of the interpretation commentary on 2 Corinthians, that Paul is not talking about an immortal soul that is housed within a perishable body. That is Greek philosophy. That is not Christian resurrection embodied theology. Most likely, Ernest Best says, Paul is referring to his own ministry. This ministry that he understands is so new and so fledgling and is being taught to a fragile part of society. He understands that it is easily breakable, but it is a treasure in a clay jar. Because see, it doesn't matter if Paul himself fails or dies because he knows that he will. Because the true treasure is the word of God. It is who Jesus is. It's the presence of Christ among us that no matter what is going on in this broken life of ours, in this broken world of ours, God so loved this broken world of ours that God sent God's solid, stable, fully human, fully divine son so that this world through him might be redeemed and not condemned. You see, friends, there is like this dualism of this reality going on, this, this broken and perishable reality of, Christi of, of our lives, of creation. And at the same time, that is there, the unperishable, the reality of God, the presence of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. It is there at the same time. So no matter how fragile this world may be, this ministry may be, this preacher may be, this community may be, the truth of the presence and the reality of God stands and by some strange, inexplicable reason works through these fallible creatures known as humans. God could easily have created things that are, cannot be destroyed. God doesn't really need us fallible humans to, to share the good news, to, to be able to complete God's work. No, and yet God chose it. And there is the mystery of the intermingling of the fragile and the solid, of the easily breakable, and the unbreakable. You see, it's there together. No matter how fragile our lives are, no matter how fragile the church is, and we know that it is, it's been dying, we've been hearing for decades. You've heard me preach more than once about things that I've read and things that have been said for at least the last 10 years about the rise of the nuns and the duns and the spiritual but not religious folks. You see, even though the church might be struggling, might be dying, it dies to what is fragile and it raises within the glory of Christ that is unbroken and unbreakable treasure. What is precious, what is beautiful, what is delicate, what is dainty in a clay jar? How does that go together the exact same way as soul church kept together and served its people and served them faithfully through the very last time that they were together in December of 2019. Just as many people, if not more, 
on that cold and dreary day came. And Pastor Leon prayed, Lord, thank you for broken people. Broken people are real. They ain't got nothing to hide behind, and that's okay. Some people believe that there's a reason for everything, including the ending of a ministry such as this that is so fulfilling the call of the Lord through the prophets of taking care of the least of these, the widows, the orphans, the homeless, the hungry, the poor, the lonely. Some of the folks in Soul Church, the parishioners, even saw the loss of a lot as something that might have happened for a reason. Jennifer Bird, Leon's wife, got a text one day from a man who had once lived on the streets, and he said, I really feel like God stopped our Sunday services on the open lot to protect God's people, the man said. Volunteers will be coming, hugging, and spreading COVID all over North Texas. I really think that we were just now starting to see why. Why God ended that particular ministry. And one of the things that Leon said with a twisting face and a broken voice on that last day was the church is not a place that we go. We, we are the church. We, these fragile, precious, easily broken or damaged, flimsy and easily destroyed creation of the one true God. Oh yeah, friends, we understand <laughs> fragility right now. We have a pandemic going on. Our economy has been tanking. There's unemployment. The numbers have been going up and down. People are losing their jobs. People might be losing their insurance that they had. There's concern over whether or not to send our kids back to school in person. If we don't send our kids back to school, that might keep them safe from getting the disease. If we do send them, we're putting not only our kids at risk, but the teachers and the administrators and the entire staff. And then if the kids bring something home, the families, it starts spreading. So it might make more sense for us just to be online. But you see what happens when we don't go to school in person, the most vulnerable of our kids don't have the safe place that they count on. Because for some kids, the only meals that they get are the ones that they get when they go to school. And for some kids, the few adults that they feel safe around are the ones that are at school. It's not an easy decision to make. Oh yeah, friends, we understand fragility. But we also understand the treasure that is in the clay jars of the fragility of humanity, the fragility of society, the fragility of life, the fragility of relationships, the fragility of church, the fragility of systems. We understand that while what we see as reality might come and go, the eternal is here. God's plan began. The reality of God's redemption for all of creation. The news was made loud and clear on the day that Jesus resurrected, the firstborn of the dead. He kicked off the finishing. The plan is already at work. 
And Paul says this in verse 16, in verse 18, because we look at what can be seen, but not, excuse me, we look not at what can be seen, but what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. This, friends, is a message of hope. When we look around and we see all of fragile life falling down around us, maybe what we're seeing isn't what is going on at all. The eternal is there. The eternal has broken through. The eternal is with us in this life. Paul writes this fourth chapter not only to defend his own ministry, but to encourage the Corinthians. We have this treasure in clay jars. We are a Afflicted in every way, but we are not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body of death, the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our lives bodies. Yes, we are fragile. Yes, the world around us is fragile, but it is not broken. It is unbroken. And so is the one who holds everything, including pieces together in God's hands. In the holy name of the one who was, who is, and who is yet to come. Amen. Friends, when we pray, we connect with God by the power of the Holy Spirit. And whenever we pray together, we connect with God and one another. It is a blessing to be able to pray together this way through this technology. And when we come to God and we come together, we are reminded that God is not Santa Claus. God is not a vending machine where we just come and we ask for what we want. God is the one who created us, who loves us, who wants a relationship with us. So let's make sure that we give God the adoration and the glory and the praise that the Lord deserves. We'll spend some time in prayer together. And as is our custom, we will end our time with the Lord's Prayer. And the words for that will be on your screen. Let us pray. Loving God, we are well aware of our fragility these days. Help us by your power. Remind us of not just your strength, but your strength that is present with us, your strength through your spirit that connects us, that builds us up, that is working even now to redeem your creation. Lord, help us to see the eternal and what is seen. Help us to see you, the unbroken, within our brokenness. Help us to see your light shining through one another, the image of God that is within each and every person. Holy One, help us to have faith and to remember the church is not a building. The church is not even a ministry. The church is us. And you are at work amongst, within, and through us. Help us to see not only you, but where we, you are going, where you are calling us to, so that we might follow and we might let your light shine. 
We thank you and we praise you for your son, Jesus, the true light. We did not have to have a veil to look upon your face in him. Thank you for his ministry. Thank you for his life. Thank you for his love. Thank you that he gave so willingly of himself so that we would understand how very, very much you love us. And thank you for the victory of the truth of your story that shone through on that first Easter morning with his resurrection. Lord, we praise you with these words that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, all of life is a gift. And whenever we give to anything or anyone, it is a way for us to respond to God in gratitude. We are grateful for your giving, how you continue to support the mission and ministry of First Presbyterian Church Plano. Once again, we are grateful and we are excited about our new street side showers clothing ministry. We are very excited about the friends that we are going to play with at Virtual Vacation Bible School next week. And we are continuing to pray and ask God to show us how we remain missional during this pandemic and church virtual version. So when you give, you give to support what God is doing in the life of this church and in the life of this community. Thank you, we appreciate it, and we say, God bless all that you do. are sent out into this fragile world, friends, with the strength of God. God's strength upholds the world and all that is in it. Not only can we trust God, we can know that we are safe and can be bold in living our lives for the glory of God. As we prepare to go out into our week, let's share in our commission and blessing together. The words that you need to speak will be on your screen. When we feel weak and we lean upon the Lord, God makes us strong. God's grace is sufficient for all that we face. May we wholly embrace that God truly is enough. Though we ourselves are frail and live in mortal bodies, we are still vessels of that which is eternal. God's everlasting power and beauty contained in earthly pots. So we do not lose heart. 
God in raising Jesus overcame and is redeeming all of creation. Indeed, the Lord is, even as we are here still worshiping together, the Spirit is at work among, within, and all around us. Friends, as you go amongst your time, may the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord make God's face to shine upon you and give you peace. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Hey.